This video has been supported by Skillshare. Hey guys, long time no see. I've been busy. No, really. I've invested all my available energy into the acceleration of the CNC machine build that I've announced last year. It's going to be bigger and heavier than I had planned. So far, I've made a video about a low runout Chinese spindle motor and another one comparing precision motion control techniques. Today, I can finally continue that series with ball screws. Um, okay, ball screws are pretty easy. All you've got to do is avoid eBay listings that look like this and everything else will probably get you started. The most common ones from China are good enough for 95% of all purposes and they have the huge advantage of being affordable. I got these from Banggood and I'm sure I could get them again if they were to wear out in a year. They probably won't though, because they are made with a technique called rolling or cold forming, which automatically hardens them a bit. These cheapos can be abused, lubricated incorrectly or not at all, and they'll probably still give you reasonable travel accuracy and a somewhat usable repeatability in the 10 to 30 micrometer neighborhood. However, I had to add quite a few extra probablys to my statements, because there is a bit of variance and practically no guarantees. Especially the longer specimen often arrive slightly bent. Others seem to have no problems whatsoever. No worries, that's not mine. My machine will be all carbon steel and not a trace of carbon wood. Here's how these ball screws work. The three orange plastic bits are internal deflectors which redirect balls to the previous row. That way they are kept in a permanent circulation until someone is careless enough to separate nut and shaft that is. Whoops. When that happens this chaos has to be manually reassembled. Wouldn't recommend it. What I would definitely recommend though is that you pay close attention to and a few more dollars for bearing blocks. The fixed bearing block has the immensely important task of immobilizing your ball screw axially. It has to withstand a constant assault of motor power versus axis inertia. And it can't have any slack or friction. In my opinion it's just as important as a ball screw, but it rarely gets as much attention. That's why the economy options are often equipped with low cost general purpose 6000Z ball bearings. Again, they can sell them for low prices that way and for low power applications they are plenty good. But there's a reason for the real deal costing between 100 and 400 bucks. That's angular contact ball bearings. They have a special geometry to better withstand axial loads in one direction. By using two of them facing in opposite directions, one can make a proper bearing block that can take bidirectional axial load. An ultra fancy lock nut on top of that is optional, but a lock nut it should be. Now I don't have a lot of electronics today, but before the purists tap out in boredom or start checking their phones, here is how I made that repeatability measurement. This cute little SMC linear voice coil motor is essentially just that. Magnets, a coil and a quadrature encoder. An external driver would send current through the coil until the programmed position has been reached according to the encoder. I don't have such a driver and for the time being I'm only interested in measuring things with it anyway. With a 1.25 micrometer resolution it puts out way too many pulses for an 80 mega to count. Well, guess I have to move it slower or overclock my 80 mega. Or I could just use the correct hardware for the job, a tiny FPGA. I mean a larger device would also be able to do this, but these guys are especially quick and easy to get started with. I followed their setup guide to get this IDE and Yosis, the open source synthesis site. From there you can synthesize and upload examples with two or three mouse clicks. Because of a minimal implementation with no USB interface chip, the FPGA itself has to work a bit harder to set up and maintain a USB serial connection. But imagine what else it could do, having those USB data pins at its disposal directly. It could receive step direction and time data from a non-real-time system and then shift it out at its own much more predictable pace. I ended up just modifying a hello world over serial example 
to keep track of my encoder position internally and only occasionally report it. When I have time I'd like to try and turn this into a PID position controller that drives the voice coil current with a DAC. But not today, we've got a bit more ballsy hardware to look at. This is the other side of the ball screw spectrum, made in Germany by Steinmeier. They are the polar opposite of the affordable ones I've shown before, by being precise, reliable, specified and guaranteed all the way through. Something like this is impractical for a hobby project though, because they are expensive AF and therefore a constant source of anxiety. Imagine accidentally getting some abrasive dust on them. <laughs> Nightmare fuel. Or limiting their lifetime by using less than ideal lubrication. Oh well, I'll do my best and take good care of them. Being of the precision ground and not rolled variety, these Steinmeiers did not get the free hardening. But they are relatively large diameters, making them plenty strong for what I have in mind. 20mm for X and Y, 25 and an especially strong and precise double nut for the Z axis. That way I hope I can mount a heavy water-cooled ATC spindle on there. That would look really good, wouldn't it? As far as my micrometer measurement is concerned, I'm afraid I'm outclassed. According to my display, it returns to zero almost exactly. That makes my 1.25 micrometer resolution inadequate for this measurement. And also something seems to make it drift slowly. That's not something that Backlash is known for. So I suspect that my wooden desk is not a particularly good precision granite surface plate and therefore unsuitable for micrometer measurements. Even if it was, this is still an unloaded system and the numbers may or may not be completely different when hundreds of kilograms of steel are moving around. Don't worry little guy, you'll do great. Also, I have no way of measuring travel accuracy over longer distances just yet. I'll think of something. Finally, I've talked about my linear rail obsession sufficiently, I think, in about every 3D printer video ever. I just wanted to add that high wind imitations can be very convincing, with a nice clean surface finish and all. But they didn't have a lot of success in imitating the friction just yet. Their carriages do not move freely at all. And when they are driven hard or fast, they get warm and wear out quickly. In my opinion, second-hand rails are usually a much better option. Because in industrial applications they are replaced preemptively, based on mileage or time, with a lot of life left in them normally. I was outrageously lucky again in this regard. These new old stock high winds aren't quite as pompous as the Steinmeier ball screws. But their job, especially with two carriages per rail, isn't quite as demanding. The planning of such a project in CAD, however, is. And that is where Skillshare can help. It's an online learning community with thousands of classes in electronics, mechanical engineering and 3D design, for example. One that was surprisingly helpful to me was this 11-hour SOLIDWORKS class. I don't even have SOLIDWORKS, but the design methodology that is demonstrated here is just something you don't pick up in day-to-day -day 3D printing. Not interested in that one? No problem. A premium membership gives you unlimited access to thousands of similarly high quality classes. These are made by real experts whose real world experiences allow you to improve your skills, to unlock new opportunities and to do the work you love. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there with an annual subscription costing no more than $10 a month. Or even better than that, the first 500 who sign up with the link in the description get two months for free. So don't wait, give it a try now and thank you for watching.